we've heard from so many people uh, in the last four days or so since our friend and colleague Les Grobstein's passing, but your story kind of became intertwined with his because he was known for being the only one to record the famous Lee Elia rant, a fact that I know that you loved. What was it about Les Grobstein's microphone that drew you to the story so much? Well, I mean, I just think, you know, first, let's just start out with the, the content of what it recorded. Um, you know, that, that's um, the first time I ever heard it. I'm trying to think back when it was, but it was, I remember, you know, Ross Glode was on our team back then. This is like 04, 05, somewhere in there. And, uh, and you know, someone brought it to us and brought us, I, I don't even know. I think it might have been Ed Farmer, to be honest with you. Someone, because obviously somebody knew about it that had been around a little bit. And, like, when we heard it, we were like, this can't be real. Like, this is not real, you know? And uh, this has to, has to be like an act or somebody just like pretending. And, you know, obviously we, we found out it was, and, and it just became something. I mean, I've heard that, I mean, that year alone, I probably listened to it a thousand times. Um, and we would turn it on in the clubhouse, you know, loudspeakers going, especially if things weren't going well and, you know, kind of feeling that frustration that uh, you could tell Lee was feeling that day, you know, just when you get into those moments where you just know you're up against it and you kind of, you know, you just kind of hate everything and everyone, and you're kind of, you know, you're kind of just in one of those ruts. So we would we would play it all the time, and um, and then you know when I found out like the backstory was like Les and who recorded it, and then you know he would come in, and then it was like yeah, you know, and then he had the recorder, and like the recorder looked like it was from like, you know, like not '83. It looked like it was like from like '43. You know, it was like really old looking, and um, so it just became kind of like, you know, Les wasn't always around with us and all stuff. So when he came in, it was kind of a special occasion. And it was clearly the topic of, of conversation every single time I saw the man. It's so it's so amazing because he loved telling stories, but there was probably no story he loved telling more than that. So the fact that you guys treated him like a celebrity or a big deal in that clubhouse, it must have been the it must have meant the world to him. I mean, I guess I, you know, he was just doing his job, but I mean, it really is like, to me, like, it's like the Zipruder film and like the JFK assassination. It's like, <laughs> it, it's like, it, you know, like, it's like, it's such a famous piece of uh, like evidence that this really happened. So I was always asking him questions like, now tell me, like, where were you standing? You know, like, I really tried to have him describe the, the situation to me because um, again, it's just, it's just a classic. I think, you know, Anybody who's ever certainly, I'm sure, managed or coached a major sports team, but players as well. I mean, you can just feel that what Lee Ilya went through that day and what he was saying and all that stuff is just like you want to do that so many times, you know, like you want to just let loose and, and just let people have it. And, and I was, you know, I found out and when you first listen to it, I'm sure everybody's the same way. When you first listen to it, there's no doubt there's this general feeling that he's generalizing the whole entire, you know, fan base and everybody in it. But the more you learn about it and you find out that it was more of a specific situation, uh, I think that happened with a couple players that day and a couple fans that, you know, I guess made contact and reached over the wall and grabbed one of his players. It, it was, there was more to it than what it sounded like, but in any event, it's still awesome. And I, and I, um, you know, I, it's just amazing. I just listened to it again, like ten minutes ago, before we got on, because I hadn't listened to it in probably about a year. And um, it's just amazing to me how many um, expressions in that uh, in that three minutes that now are in my life permanently that I use. Eighty-five um, percent of the world's working. The other fifteen come out here. Yeah, I, exactly that one. Um, the other day I was golfing and I get up to a shot that I hit and. Uh, you know, it was one that I, I was like, okay, that could be okay. That could be, I don't know. We'll see when we get up there. And I get up to it, and it's a terrible lie. And um, I, I get up to it, and I go, this is a disheartening, leaping situation we're in right now. Um, and so it's, I don't even think about it. Stuff just comes out of me when it comes to that, uh, you know, and, and as well as other guys I played with. I mentioned Ross and other guys. We just, it's constantly something that is, like, intertwined in our verbiage to each other. That's incredible to think that you quote the Lee Elia rant on the golf course like a generation quotes Caddyshack or Happy Gilmore. Like, I cannot tell you how happy that makes me. That's the greatest thing. Yeah, I've ever I mean, heard. I was in the football pool the other day. I had the Cardinals, and, you know, you saw what happened in that game. And, you know, the text right away, like in the first quarter, was the Cardinals are really effing behind us. 
you know, like, <laughs> like, so it's like so many things that come out, um, you know, um, I, I can't, I mean, literally every single like line of that whole thing has been used in some capacity. Uh, you know, I don't know how many times it's, it's, uh, it's just become, like I said, part of, especially with some of the guys I know with the White Sox PR guy, Bob Bechtel, uh, Brian Johnson, uh, who handles all the computer stuff, uh, with the team. I mean, we can't get through, you know, six, seven text messages back and forth without, without a reference to that rant, you know? That is so amazing. We're talking to Paul Canerico, uh, the world's foremost authority now that Les Grobstein has left us on the Lee Elia rant here on The Score. D- Paul, did you ever make Les an offer for the microphone? Well, I mean, I, a blank check I feel like is an offer. You know, like I was like, man, just, just let me know what you want for, for it. But he was still using that, you know, that uh, apparatus, I'll call it. You know, he was still using it and – it was kind of like one of those things like, all right, maybe down the line, down the line. But, you know, um, I mean, really, that thing should be in the Smithsonian, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Not not Cooperstown, the Smithsonian. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, it's got to be bigger than Cooperstown. Bigger than Cooperstown. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree. Well, I, you'll be thrilled to know uh, that today at Les's funeral, the microphone and the recorder were displayed prominently. They were there. I love it. That's a, as, as well it should have been. And uh, it's amazing it still worked. I think it still worked. I mean, I know it still worked, you know, years after when I was with Les, but I'm guessing he still was using it. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, again, and, and the, you know, the flip side also is that I, I got to meet Lee, um, Greg Walker, who was our hitting coach, knew Lee from in the past when he played. And so, like, when Lee, I think, was with Seattle and he was doing some hitting work and you know, because like, I was like, I got to meet him, you know, like I know all of them and I always knew of him, but like I never shook his hand. I never met him. And so I met him down in the cages in Chicago there at our stadium. And, you know, and he, and he really, this was before he had like um, the little thing there where they was kind of like to make amends and they had kind of like a, a thing to kind of bring him back because, but when I met him, he still, you know, felt very terrible about the fact that, you know, it, 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 it did what it did, you know, from his perspective, it wasn't as funny as we make it out to be, but I think now it's kind of been all been put to rest and he's a great guy. And, um, you know, like I'm sure everybody that's played with him, played for him, uh, you know, it's been with them knows that he, you know, they would say the same thing, you know, he's a great guy and just a great baseball man, you know? Yeah, of course he had a bad day and he, he, he let it all out. Right. That's all no yeah. big deal. So that's probably one of my favorite parts of the whole thing is like, you listen to this thing and you must be like, wow, these guys must have been like, you know, uh, you know, th- that must have been their 112th loss of the season. This must have been the most grueling season of all time. You can kind of understand he lost it. And then you find out, you know, it's 18 games into the season. <laughs> and you're like, my, like, he got there fast, you know? Yeah, be it right. 18, 18 baseball games and he, lo- he lost yeah. his damn mind. Uh, yeah. Well- they gain all that hard work, you know. <laughs> right, exactly. Oh, they it, it's it's a grind. Uh well well Les's family <laughs> let, let Les's family actually they they're going to be selling his memorabilia. He, co- he he collected everything and I guess that was part of the plan that you know he wanted to keep it and now that he's passed away his family does want to be be selling some memorabilia. So I have no no pressure but I I have no idea how serious you are, but if you would like us to put you in touch with a member of the Grobstein family, they absolutely are going to be looking to selling some of his memorabilia down the road. I will look into that. I would I, I am not a memorabilia person. Uh, but I will tell you that again, that, that one thing, cause it's just a great, um, you know, uh, play thing to have. And, and like I said, like if someone's like, what is that? Um, you say, well, let me play this for you. And, uh, you <laughs> right. can say this, that right there was recorded on this, this thing here. And, um, you know, I, I was talking to, uh, Bob with the White Sox, as you know, before I came on and I was like, we were talking about the famous rants of all time, whether it's like the Bobby Knight one with one of his players or Tommy the Sword has had a few of them. And I'm like, well, what guy out there in the world right now is about to get on a radio show and do an interview about one that happened almost 40 years ago? So to me, there's none of them that come close to, you know, what this was, you know? 
Yeah, absolutely. It it has it has staying power. It's on all of the lists for the greatest blowups nationally. But you know, Lee Elia, like not as much star power of a you know of a Bobby Knight, and then maybe some of like right. you know the the football rants, like NFL, just like a little bit more popular in our consciousness today. But in Chicago, and certainly on this radio station, the number one sports station in this city, Lee Elia, number one with a bullet. Nothing will ever else come close. Yeah, yeah, nothing. I mean. Put it this way: If someone uh, p- tried to compete with that one nowadays, um, oh, man, yeah. there's no telling. Uh, they would probably lock him up and throw away the key. You know? Yeah, the career's over. C- career, career's yeah. over. You, you have been canceled. You have been deplatformed. There's absolutely no way uh, you you could get away with it. And there's there's something about like the the baseball blow. I mean, you know, you you were around Ozzy a lot. You know he could he could blow up he could have a bit of a temper I'm sure you were around I know you go out there and you turn your TV on and watch your stupid football when the football player don't give a about you yeah you know so you 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 were around your fair share of it I have to imagine yeah I, well I just think that like that what listening to the Lee Elliott is like I was fortunate enough and I'm proud to say that I mean guys that are playing nowadays they don't know any better you know it's like you come up and you only know what you know um, it would be like somebody in college now you know, doesn't know maybe how fun it was to be in college in the seventies or the eighties or something like that. And, um, but they only know what they know, but I, the beginning of my career still had kind of that old school, um, kind of like, you know, group involved where you had, you know, coaches and managers smoking in the dugout and you had, you know, yeah, you, you just had that. And it's, that to me is like, if you go way back in history of baseball connected to that, I mean, things nowadays, um, I mean, the game is great, always will be great, but let's be honest, it's gotten a lot more, you know, just sterile and a lot more, you know, cleaned up in terms of that type of stuff where, um, you know, they, they don't want that. It's, it's, it's definitely a business and you're trying to sell something. They don't want, you know, people chewing tobacco. They don't want people yelling, you know, hurling expletives across the field. They don't want Earl Weaver, you know? Um, and so it's, it's, you know, it's 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 fun to watch those things from the past because even way before my time, you watch some things and you're like, this is, you know, but it, it all worked, right? Like no one, you know, it all it all seemed to figure itself out. The umpires, the managers, the the media, like it all just kind of seemed to figure itself out. Like everybody was a big boy and kind of figured it out. But now, you know, you can't really go there as much with stuff like that. It becomes a bigger issue with all the, uh, I guess, just the social media stuff and everything. Everything gets so hot so quick that it's. It's almost like it just it just went a different direction, you know. Back then, it was a little different, I guess. And um, you know, it is what it is. But uh, you definitely, uh, you know, wish. I let's put it this way: the people haven't changed, humans haven't changed. Every manager, I promise you, is dying to go off like Lee Ilya. They just <laughs> yes. can't. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and that's the thing. Like t- today's athletes, they're obviously amazing, but they're you know it's all three percent body fat. They all have nutritionists and trainers and massage therapists and everything. Like, it is pretty impressive to be able to throw a no hitter on LSD or come in in a World Series game <laughs> after a couple of beers or like you know hit a triple with some cocaine in your pocket. Like obviously we've progressed, but it it did kind of speak to how incredible the athletes were back then too that they were also doing it while impaired. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we're not encouraging. I mean, I of think things, something's changed for the better. There's, there's a lot of things that have changed in, in this game or our game and, and other games that I don't like and, and I, I wish it would go back. But there are some things, you know, for the betterment of, of the players and their and their lives. It's definitely gotten better in terms of, like, how smart they are in terms of their financials, right. uh, smart they are in terms of, like, how to treat their bodies. You know, so not all change is bad. Um, but, like, it's not – I mean, listen, now you watch baseball – you can't. You don't even see like a manager rarely. You can't argue anymore because they got the replay, and and it's like it's like oh okay, it was he was safe. You can't argue it. Like you can't. If you come out of the dugout, so you get thrown out. So it's kind of like um, I do miss those like the characters of the game. And Ozzy was probably one of the last ones in terms of like you know having that just flamboyant, crazy you know uh, personality because it's just. I'm not saying it's not allowed. It's just that it's been confined now from all different directions uh, that you can't be like that if you want to. Uh, teams don't want to have to deal with, you know, um, that kind of stuff on, on a daily basis, whether, you know, if a manager blows up an umpire after the game or blows up his own player, 
or gets into it. They just they want it to just be kind of you know you know n- none of that type of drama, and that's where it's kind of evolved to. And who knows? Maybe it'll evolve back the other way. Who knows? No one's got a crystal ball, you know. 